Today, I'll be taking you through a virtual tour of our Environmental Education and Research Center. But before we get started, go ahead and scan this code to take a short quiz to test your knowledge. The EERC was purchased by Kentucky State University with the Kentucky Heritage Land Conservation Fund back in 2007. It was purchased to be used as a center to educate the public about the environment, which we do through guided hikes, citizen science programs, and interactive lessons and activities. Before it was purchased by KSU, a large portion of this land was used for farming, meaning that most of the forested area you'll see on the tour used to be fields. Keep this period of ecological succession in mind as we take you through several habitats and features of the EERC. Here at the EERC, we have a variety of locations to host immersive, hands-on activities for learners of all ages. The pavilion by our 1.5 acre pond can easily host classes upward of 30 individuals comfortably, with tables designed with accessibility in mind. We hope to soon open another outdoor classroom along one of our trails so that students can be surrounded by late succession woodland all around them. These sites lack many of the confining features of traditional indoor classrooms. The small windows and brick walls of the cliched schoolhouse are traded for the natural light and healthy flora of a temperate woodland. These amenities are not without their own limitations, however. There are no smart boards or overhead projectors to assist us in keeping the attention of young people. The absence of these tools does allow us to focus on hands-on experiences so that the more tactile learners may have the opportunity to learn in an environment that is more conducive to their strengths. On top of the obvious scientific classroom observations that can be made when learning while immersed in one's environment, we encourage artful interpretations to be made in these spaces as well. Countless artists have drawn inspiration from the natural world. We welcome groups interested in visual or literary arts to be included in the environmental education and to participate in active observation of the natural world. While at the EERC's pond, you're likely to see a variety of wildlife, ranging from bluegills to river otters. In the spring and summer, you'll be able to hear a chorus of spring peepers, green frogs, and hundreds of katydids and crickets. And as the temperatures drop, migratory birds fly through the area and use the pond as a resting point to catch fish and recharge. The pond area includes a deck that extends into a paved walking path around the edges of the pond, where students can fully immerse themselves into one of our most notable wetland habitats. During the summer months, students can participate in our fishing activities, which keeps our fish population from reaching its carrying capacity. With all the fishing activities and a little help from our otter friends, we're able to keep our fish population low and healthy, which in turn keeps our pond in good shape. Most of the environmental education programs we offer here at the EERC happen at the Pavilion, where we guide K-12 and 4-H students through hands-on activities. Additionally, we host guided hikes and camping activities for local Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops. You'll also see several conservation practices like rain barrels, barbed wire removal projects, and artificial shelters like bird boxes and brush piles. You may have heard of the term conservation before, but what does that actually mean? Webster's Dictionary defines conservation as the planned management of protecting and preserving some natural resource. So what does that look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. All of the storm water that is gonna wash off of this roof is going to go directly down into this rain barrel. And without this, all of that water would just flow over the land. And in urban areas, all of that water is gonna flow over cultivated lawns that are going to have pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, and even pet waste. If you ever forget to pick up after your dog, yep that's going to go straight into the storm drain. So these rain barrels are a really great way to take care of that excess water runoff. Vernal pools are another type of wetland habitat that is common to this region. What's a vernal pool? Great question. In its simplest terms, a vernal pool is a natural seasonal wetland that forms a depression in the land that catches and holds rainwater runoff in melted snow. The term vernal stems from the Latin word ver, meaning spring. So where I'm standing right now is the far edge of the pool. Now in the spring, water will fill to this point and amphibians use these warmer waters to lay their eggs on submerged vegetation and debris, like this fallen tree branch. Since the water level is constantly changing, it doesn't make a suitable habitat for fish, which lessens predations of the eggs of many amphibians, like salamanders and frogs. In addition, other indicator species of the vernal pool include reptiles like turtles and tiny crustaceans like fairy shrimp. So this is a sinkhole. Um, a lot of you may be very familiar with these. They're very common in Kentucky. 
Um, Kentucky is characterized by what is called karst topography. And that just means that when you take a look at the region around Kentucky, you're gonna start seeing a lot of those sinkholes and a lot of cave systems. Now, why is that? Well, Kentucky has many different types of rocks, and one of those rocks is limestone. And limestone actually makes up 50% of all surface rock in Kentucky. Limestone um, is comprised of a chemical called calcium carbonate, which exists in the stone as its crystalline form, calcite. So when it rains, the rainwater is saturated with CO2, which interacts with the calcite and ends up eroding the rock. Um, and that's going to give us a lot of these little sinkholes. So the groundwater that exists underneath the sinkholes doesn't go away. Um, and that just means that it is going to end up being a very potable source of drinking water, but it also means that it's susceptible to um, people throwing trash into sinkholes. A lot of times different chemicals such as pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, even pet waste will all wash into that sinkhole and it puts our groundwater at risk for being contaminated. These fields are being measured for a variety of projects that seek to develop and inform best management practices for landowners in our region. The data collected here is used to answer questions that we have about land management practices and their impacts. This field was used for row crop production many years ago and was left fallow for several years. Unfortunately, that meant that invasive species were allowed to grow without any control. This happens many times when the fields are no longer financially viable for crop production for one reason or another. In the case of this field, we assessed that it would be a great location for a lowland meadow and a great chance for to study how native plantings would fare with a variety of field preparation methods. Sections were randomly assigned with different planting methods that had different pros and cons, and the seeds were planted. The seeds that were put into the soil were from several native grasses and flowers that are known to be beneficial to pollinator populations. The growth of these plants and the traffic of native pollinators were measured to decide how effective the different methods were at establishing thriving habitats for native pollinators. This is just one of the interesting research topics that we have hosted here at the EERC. For experiential learning opportunities based on this site or others, students can develop their own observational hypotheses, collect and compare data, and test those hypotheses with the help of our staff. Early settlement in an area that doesn't already have extensive infrastructure is called homesteading. Remnants of settlements similar to the ones found here at the EERC were made centuries ago to establish sustenance farming locations for families in small communities. Many of the supplies used to make these structures had been collected from nearby sources. The stones used to construct this root cellar and home were likely collected from quarries less than 10 miles away. That doesn't seem like a great distance to us these days, but for the people building it that didn't have access to modern transportation, that could have taken a day just to retrieve one load of material from that distance, providing they had access to two good horses and a carriage. What's that sound? It sounds like one of the many cool water features at the EERC. This waterfall seems to be a fan favorite of many EERC visitors. You can find it just past the pollinator research fields in Six Mile Creek. Just looking at the visual beauty and listening to the sometimes calm, sometimes raging water, it's easy to see why. In addition to its aesthetic value, shallow waterfalls like this have important ecological functions. This is one reason we love to bring visitors to the waterfall. Shallow waterfalls are formed through erosion. The water carves a path from high to low and waterfalls are created as water erodes the limestone and other soft rocks as it is pulled down by gravity, leaving sharper rocks behind. Depending on how much time you have, the results can vary widely. Whether we're looking at a small waterfall on a creek or something much bigger like Cumberland Falls, the process that forms them is the same. The tops of waterfalls, especially small ones like this, are usually shallow, and during low flow, they make much better stream and river crossings than the rest of the deeper channel. For this reason, waterfalls have historically been sites of important stream crossings by indigenous people and others. Still, to this day, the waterfall is a favorite stream crossing site for deer and other critters. We like to feature the waterfall when teaching lessons about macroinvertebrates and water quality. Macroinvertebrates are small animals without a backbone that can be seen with the naked eye. We find macroinvertebrates in streams and they can be used as bioindicators to tell us how clean the water is. The different flow pattern supplies unique habitat for macros, fish, and amphibians compared to other parts of the stream. Waterfalls act as natural aerators, turning the water so oxygen can easily dissolve. This part of Six Mile Creek has been used to research the health of native mussel populations. Speaking of cool things about the creek, have you seen these? These are stream islands and they're also called alluvial islands. So alluvial islands, much like waterfalls, have very unique water habitats 
and they are created by soil deposition and erosion. Actually, because of the high water flow from waterfalls and the high sediment transportation from waterfalls, they also assist in creating these alluvial islands. These alluvial islands are also home to very diverse vegetation that you can kind of see around me. Um, and this vegetation is what stops these islands from being eroded during rain events. These islands are also home to uh, macroinvertebrates, fish, and all sorts of mussels. And we know this because we'll see them um, hanging out in these pools along the stream banks. And a lot of times we'll find those mussel shells right along the stream banks as well. Normally crayfish stay in the water, but their empty shells in the bank tell us that a predator also lives here the river otter. Otters like to use this location to hunt for crayfish. The forests of North America are habitat for many animal species. Looking around the EERC, we find evidence of forest animals all around us. For instance, take a look at these fox dens. The foxes probably like this area because of its proximity to our pollinator field and neighboring farmland. While they nest in the forest, they generally prefer to be near diverse habitats. Their hunting grounds include cropland, pastureland, and mixed forest. While foxes do dig their own dens, they are known to take over dens abandoned by other animals, like badgers. What's that sound? A pileated woodpecker, of course. That's the largest woodpecker in North America. You can recognize them by their distinctive bright red crest. These birds use their beak to peck through rotting wood for ants. Pileated woodpeckers leave distinctive rectangular holes in the trees that they feed on. They nest in the cavity of dead trees like this one. We sometimes hear them pecking dead ash trees while we're working at the EERC. So as we approach this site, you may notice several downed trees. And if you look closely, you'll also start to see all of these curved markings along this tree. So in 2009, an invasive species called the emerald ash borer was documented in Kentucky and has been spreading through the state ever since. So why is this a problem? Well, these tiny green metallic beetles like to burrow into the bark of the tree and the females will lay their eggs underneath that bark and so when the eggs hatch, that larva is going to start feeding on the phloem and cambium of the tree, which will stop their nutrients from getting from point A to point B and eventually kill the tree. So our ash tree species have become the primary target for emerald ash borers, but don't panic just yet. We've noticed that a lot of these primary targets have been our green ash and our white ash, but we have also noticed that a lot of our blue ash have shown some resistance to the emerald ash borer. And as we continue on through time, we're gonna start noticing that the forest habitat is going to start changing just a little bit. Um, a lot of these uh, big trees are allowing um, sunlight to come in where they normally would not um, through these gaps in the canopy. And so we're gonna start seeing a lot of other plants that would normally not receive light start to grow from that sunlight. Um, and this is going to include plants that are also invasive species like multiflora rose. So as our tour comes to a close, I want to thank all of you for following along at home. And I hope you enjoyed seeing a little bit of our center today. Now, if hiking isn't really your cup of tea, we also assist with Kentucky River Thorough Red Boat Tours, where we do water quality activities with many students. And we also do in-school lessons. Um, you can schedule any lesson with us. And if you have any questions about doing so, you can reach out to us at kysuag at gmail.com. Um, I hope you all have a great day. Stay safe, have fun, and keep learning.